도망치는 거형 때문이라고 생각했거든. 이게 다형 때문이라고. I stumbled upon a new series this weekend that I'm absolutely in love with. If you follow me on Twitter, which I wouldn't advise you to because I'm super lazy on social media, but if you do, you might be aware of this new masterpiece. But of course, almost every Korean drama is a masterpiece in its own right. And this latest series that is still ongoing on Netflix is called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. And I have to tell you that it's the title that captured my interest the most. I was thinking a funny comedy, which it is, but instead the show took me on a beautiful, frightening, emotional journey. There are so many fairy tales coming together in this one show. In fact, it's a true joy to try and spot a reference from Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, Rapunzel, Alice in Wonderland, and almost every non fairy tale out there. The story will be dreadful, melancholy, and calamitous. A word which here means dreadful and melancholy. That is because not very many happy things happen. And you'll find out just a couple of minutes in that there is a very powerful reason for this. The whole show is wrapped around a pretty bow of fairy tales and destiny and fascinating stories that really make you think. In fact, almost every episode is named after a story within the show. But I'm getting ahead. I will really try to make this review spoiler free so that anyone who is interested can go and watch the shows later. Still, I might slip up, so spoiler warning. <laughs> Our fairy tale romance starts with a very interesting story. It's about a girl who lives in a castle all alone. She grew lonely and went out to make friends, but no one would accept her because they say death follows her. Angered and saddened by this, she goes out to hurt something else. And there we see her fishing and brutally killing the fish. Her hook catches something else, but instead of a fish, it turns out to be a boy. She saves the boy's life and the narrator says that she's never been sad again. Because instead of the shadow of death, the boy follows her everywhere she goes. Something happens. I'm not sure what, but the girl puts the boy to some test. We see her killing butterflies and then asking the boy if he still loves her. As you would expect if you found someone cutting butterflies in the park, the boy did what we all should, run away. We shift from the animation to real life and we see a very beautiful woman standing on top of a balcony that is eerily similar to the one that is in the story. Then we hear another voice caution her to never fall in love. <laughs> This voice is revealed to be her mother. I'd like to point out how creative the artwork is in this instance. It is hauntingly brilliant and takes me back to simpler times in Tim Burton's head. Ideas like The Nightmare Before Christmas, I am the Pumpkin King, Beetlejuice, and others like Coraline have the same kind of animation. A world more exciting than this. Uh -huh. It looks seemingly simple, but it's very expressive and horrifying. It takes common appearances, but gives them an out of this world look that usually tells us more about the characters. Like how the girl in this story has hair that moves on its own, almost evil. It also shields her from view, and all we see is her tiny legs. It gives you the impression that there's a big burden she's carrying with her. This type of animation is much more clever as it tackles more psychological threads by being both grotesque and unusual so that there are two different stories being told, what we as the viewers think and what the storyteller is trying to tell us. These concepts, these animations really set this world apart. Cut to the present and I have to say, if there's something else I really enjoy about this show are all those transitions. I just love them. We meet two main characters, Moon Gangte and Moon Sangte, played by Kim So Hyun and Oh Jung Se, respectively. I know I'm butchering those names. Sangte happens to be autistic, and we see this in how he keeps repeating himself, how he's so stressed out over minor problems and all the different reactions. I'm not sure if this is the exact uh, disorder, but autism spectrum disorder is a condition related to brain development that impacts how a person perceives and socializes with others, causing problems in social interaction and communication. The disorder also includes limited and repetitive patterns of behavior. This is something else that the show tackles. In fact, it's probably the whole point of the show. It's okay to not be okay. 
Mental illness is something that many people face and it's not given the care and attention that it should. This show brings up mental illness as part of its overall arc, making us as viewers in many ways sympathize and understand what people could be going through and even broadly how mental illness affects families. With Sangte being autistic, therefore all his life his brother had to take care of him and this is something that Gangte does really well. And I'll tell you right now, all those moments in the series of those two interacting are probably the best. It's so sad. I was in tears by the third episode. <laughs> Sangte gets fired and through another transition we see Gangte resume his work as a nurse. We see that he is covered in scars. The reason why this transition is good is just the simple walking into and out of the light. I like that there are so many meanings to it, particularly that this is a brand new start. At work he learns about a fairy tale reading that's going to be taking place later that day and it turns out that it is Sangte's favorite children's book author, Ko Moon Ki. Ko Moon Yi, acted by Seo Ye Ji, is another main character in a gothic paradise. She's the type of person who probably sees a kid lose a balloon and starts laughing. And if the kid doesn't lose the balloon, then she'll probably bust it out of sheer pleasure. And as a character, she fits in the fairy tale imagery perfectly. When you do see her, you immediately imagine someone with a soft voice and kind spirit. Instead, you get a fox. Remember how I said almost every single episode is named after a fairy tale book within the story? Well, meet the author within the story. Her books and ideas are all about removing or destroying the notion that everything is a fairy tale. Yeah, I know, it sounds so weird. She tells a little kid that she should not want to be the pretty princess, but the pretty witch. That at first seems to be a madness to her stories and you sort of wonder if kids should even be reading them. But by the end of the episode you discover there's a beautiful psychological reason. Our two main leads meet, and as is the case with almost every K drama, I'm left wondering how long two people can stare at each other. Gangte misses an opportunity to get an autograph for his brother, mostly because he's kind of pissed off by her weird behavior. And Ko, on the other hand, realizes that there's something special about this man a kind of destiny. The whole series is very clever in creating parallels that help us better sympathize with our main characters. In this case, she's here to read about The Boy Who Feeds on Nightmares, one of her most popular books. And it has a very interesting parallel that plays out here. In this case, at this exact moment, in the same hostel, kind of like Destiny, a father and daughter have been admitted. The father tried to kill them both. However, the two are soon going to be separated and this is something that the father doesn't want. In desperation, he tries to find his daughter in Ko's fairy tale reading and carries her off to kill her. Ko, probably remembering her own childhood, comes to the rescue and here is where we get the flashback of what her father tried to do to her. At this point, it's obvious that this is not just your everyday romance story, but there's a lot of horrifying subtext. A father trying to kill his own doctor, extreme mental problems like dementia, and the heartbreaking effect autism has in the overall story. Therefore, I'll really praise this whole show and how it looks at psychological problems we all go through. <laughs> In a way, they have made everyone look both sane and insane at the same time, bringing forward the idea that we're all going through some kind of mental stress in need of help. Even if it's just as simple as hating your boss, Gangte comes to the rescue and we have another powerful meeting. The true beauty of the director's mind is brought into view here. Sometimes when you watch a show, you sense the director trying to tell you something. In this case, we see the mural creating another parallel of our two leads, the witch and the boy who fed on nightmares. Yeah, I know I'm talking in gibberish right now since I haven't yet told you the story about the book. But bear with me, this parallel is actually very clever as you go forward into the series. <laughs> No, 
So Sante gets cut by Ko and acts like it was nothing at all. Earlier we saw him get vomited on and seemed to enjoy it. And then the idea that he passionately takes care of his brother, a task that most people will probably shy away from. We see a side of him that's very important in the story. Living with his brother has taught him not to hold on to things, to let go so that he won't get angry in front of someone who is desperately in need of care. However, it's also made it impossible for him to have a long-lasting relationship or build stronger bonds. It's here that we get a conclusion to the story, the boy who fed on nightmares. It's about a boy who used to have frightening nightmares all the time. Bad memories of his past kept haunting him, making him scared to fall asleep again, and he wanted to be rid of them. So he begged a witch to take away all those nightmares, and in return he would do as the witch commands. The witch granted his request, and at another red moon the witch came back to claim what the boy had promised. But the boy screamed at her with so much resentment, saying, all my nightmares are gone, but why can't I be happy? So the witch took the boy's soul and said, and I'm paraphrasing here, she says that only those with memories of deep regret, memories of being abandoned, only they can become more passionate, stronger, emotionally flexible, and only they can achieve true happiness. So we should remember all of it, overcome it. If we don't, then we'll be just like a kid whose soul never grows old. I really love this story and it's complemented with another parallel. Sang Tae keeps having recurring dreams about butterflies chasing him trying to kill him. I like that it's butterflies. Maybe it has another meaning but for me, the fact that it is butterflies is much more intense. Why? Because I have never heard of anyone being harmed by a butterfly. Also using butterflies helps us get into the mind of the autistic character because we don't see it as a problem but we see through the eyes of this autistic person that he really has no choice but to try and overcome it. To me, it's honestly a beautiful story with a brilliant emotional ride. Like I said, I've cried. There are so many other important characters. One of my favorite is actually Lee Sang In, played by Kim To Kyun. I don't know why, but I just really like this character and his mild insanity of trying to protect Ko's image. There's also Yuri, played by Park Kyo Yang, who is madly in love with Gang Tae, but I don't think Gang Tae, even though she exists, later on this love triangle becomes even more precious. But probably the most important secondary character in the show is their childhood friend Jo Jai So, played by Kang Ki Dong. And the reason for that is, remember how I said Gang Tae keeps moving? Jo Jai Se keeps moving along with them, despite them just being friends. He has a very strong friendship with Sang Tae, proving that even people with autism can have strong relationships with people outside of their families. Also, Jo Jai So acts like a balance in the whole story, making what might be heartbreaking problems manageable and even bringing some joy to the overall story. <laughs> Towards the end of the episode, the two meet again and Ko makes the declaration that she wants him and she's going to get him. Something like destiny. We're still not sure if it's part of her obsessive, destructive nature or something genuine, but boy, do I want this to get going. Choice. The two are just so adorable together and all the actors are doing such an amazing job that even small glances convey a lot of emotion. So yeah, I highly recommend it. I give it a perfect 8 out of 10. And the reason for the imperfect score is in later episode it does get a bit slow and it does bring in so many characters and plot points making it feel like there is no linear story. But if you're willing to be patient and understand all the parallels being created, I can promise you that there's a reason for it. It might teach you something valuable about yourself, but most definitely you'll be amazed at how artful it is. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much guys for watching this with a very weird narrator. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next time.